name is Teresa. And today we're going to talk to you about something which is probably an extension of what we took to last time about sailing around the world and what it costs. Today we're going to discuss with you how we sail across oceans and what we did to prepare for proper offshore sailing. So it's obviously summertime, some of you may be preparing to do the arc across the Atlantic later this year um, and others are just going to be watching this as a bit of an information session and obviously you can apply what we're saying to crossing any ocean or doing any offshore crossing. Um, this is based purely on our experiences so as always if you have any comments, questions or you disagree with what we're saying then just leave those comments in the, in the section below and we'll um, yeah, keep the discussion going. So I think we're going to split this into a different couple of sections. Um, I think the first thing to start with would be what sort of boat you need uh, and that's what sort of boat we had, uh, what we chose um, and why we chose that and why we you know our thought process is in getting a good ocean going boat i think the second thing is going to be the safety equipment that we put on board the third thing is going to be other equipment we put on board that we needed or we felt that we needed um, to get us across oceans and the fourth thing i think is going to be little things that we put on board and took with us that just added to our general level of comfort rather than it being a necessity so some things we're not going to be talking about in this session, um, which is probably important to point out from the outset, you know, this is such a huge subject and we're not going to be delving into how to provision, we're not going to be delving into kind of uh, getting weather at sea or anything like that, There's going to be, or, or how to set your sails for downwind sailing. So there's a lot of aspects of kind of trade wind passage making that we're not going to be touching on. This is more about equipment. Uh, that we have on our boat and that we've used for our Atlantic crossing. So let's just start with the boat. Um, I think when we talked last time about how much a boat costs, we had a lot of feedback, people saying, well, you can buy a boat for a lot less and you can buy a boat for a lot more. This is just based on on what, what we did. And it, they're going to be broad strokes. We chose a boat that was about 40 foot. I think if you look to statistics for the rallies that cross oceans, now the average size is 45, 46 foot. We wanted a boat that we could sail completely manually. Our, you know, kind of worries sometimes came from what if we have complete electrical outage? What if we get hit by lightning? What if this breaks? What if that breaks? What if the batteries break? So we wanted a boat that was small enough to be able to handle with no electricity just with like maybe batteries and a handheld radio that was powered with little normal batteries. We felt that maybe below 40 foot, the, the boat wouldn't go fast enough and would be difficult to handle in kind of rough weather. And way above 40 foot, you start to need additional systems to get the boat to move to full sails where you've got electric winches and you've got massive mains that need to be pulled in and out. You need more strength and you need a different complexity of system. So we, back when we made the decision, wanted 40 foot or around 40 foot. I think now, given our time again, we'd probably go slightly larger, but again, we also had a budget to stick to. Mm -hmm. When it came to boats, we knew that we weren't just planning on crossing the Atlantic. There are a lot of people that just want to do go from Europe to the Caribbean, doing one of the rallies, and do a couple of seasons in the Caribbean, see how it goes, and then come back. For that sort of crossing, those downwind crossings, although fairly daunting when before you've done them, after the fact, they're not that difficult. You, the boat just sails itself. Even if you had no sails, the current would take you across the Caribbean eventually anyway. So you haven't got to have like an amazing boat that's built like a tank. There are hundreds and hundreds of production yachts, European and American and South African brands that go across. So you don't need a kind of like super expensive blue water cruiser. You can do it in, you know, what is sometimes rudely termed the, the average white boat. We wanted something to circumnavigate. We planned on circumnavigating, we still do. And there are times when we are going to be a lot further from kind of like a FedEx office to get, to get spares shipped than we would be comfortable with or we would find in the Caribbean or in Europe. So we wanted a boat that was really, really well built. The big difference between kind of like more expensive marks and cheaper marks or production boats as I would call them is that production boats are generally built to a price point. They're very price sensitive. 
and so sometimes they make compromises to the rigidity and the sturdiness of bits of equipment that may need to be upgraded at a later time. So for instance, things like blocks and lines, um, you know, and standing rigging will need to be I'd, be, I'd be happy with like slightly sturdier blocks, slightly sturdier fittings, slightly thicker stainless steel, slightly thicker hull, and these things cost more money. Where you go to these kind of big blue watermarks that do cost more, they do tend to have stronger and better built equipment. We used to own an, uh, like an like a production yacht. We love that yacht and we thought long and hard about taking her across the oceans. Our feeling was she just wasn't strong enough to do it. And yeah. Yeah. As I mean, as Nick said though, if you're just planning the one ocean crossing or even two just to get you to the Caribbean and back from Europe or perhaps you're in America and you're wanting to go to Europe. So if you're not planning to do ocean crossings kind of on a regular basis or you're not planning to circumnavigate, then um, the stress that the kind of rigging and the fittings are going to be under is going to be fairly minimal because it's you're going to be doing the downwind sailing. You're going to be doing the ocean crossing for such a small amount of the time that you're sailing overall. So um, yeah, it just really depends on what your plans are. So here's the thing, just by example, to clarify this, we had our last our last boat before this one, they both had the sails made by the same company and it's one of the biggest sail companies in the world. With our last boat, the main sail, there was something wrong with it. Well, I had the boat from new and I really wasn't happy with it. it. It didn't sit right, it wasn't cut right. When I found out that this boat was being uh, built with the same sail, by the same, the same manufacturer, I talked to them and said, listen, we had this boat built, we had a, a previous boat uh, production yacht with your sails on and now we're buying this yacht with your sails on I'm worried about the sail quality. The rep said with the deepest respect although they have the same label on they are a completely different quality and come from a completely different um, sail loft and it's true mm. the sails that came with this boat are super high quality they're Dacron we didn't want performance sails because we're not performance sailors but we wanted strong sails they are a completely different level of Dacron sail to the ones we had before. Same label, same sticker, these were not built to a price point. So the other thing to consider is obviously the boat that is perfect for crossing an ocean may not be the boat that is perfect for the destination that you're heading towards. So for spending time in the Caribbean, cruising around the, the islands, the BVIs, the Bahamas, you may not want the same kind of boat that you would prefer for your ocean crossing so obviously there's going to have to be a compromise um, so a good example is you know a, a center cockpit boat would be better for crossing an ocean because it's you know you're spending your time in the center of the boat it's safer it's more comfortable um, it tends to be that the the motion is uh, less kind of marked when you're in the center of the boat the motion of the boat so it's generally a more comfortable sail and a lot of the kind of purpose-built blue water cruisers have center cockpits for that reason. Um, however, in the Caribbean or I've never, we've never sailed in the Mediterranean, but I dare say the Med is exactly the same. You are probably wanting to spend a lot of your time outside in the cockpit, kind of lazing around, jumping off the back or off the side of the boat, swimming. So your cockpit becomes like a, a living area and for that reason you would probably want to have a bigger cockpit, perhaps an aft cockpit like what we have. We have a lovely large aft cockpit which isn't particularly ideal for crossing an ocean but it's great for being in the Caribbean. So that is obviously a decision that is a personal one um, and that you would have to make yourself but that is another consideration to, to keep in mind. So let's just deal with the big safety items, the big ticket items you will need to cross oceans. For a lot of the rallies there's a very strict list and they won't actually let you start unless you have these items. So let's just have a look. Firstly a life raft. You need a life raft for the number of people that will be on this yacht and it is important to point out here that the biggest life raft is actually not the best. If you instance, for instance have four people on a yacht and you have a 12-man life raft and you do have to use it, you will all be thrown around a lot in the life raft. So buy the life raft for the number of people you will have on the boat. The life raft has to be to a certain standard. There are international standards and the 
uh, it has to be in date. There's a three year service interval and it's got to be in date. Another aspect of safety equipment is, uh, which is again is a requirement, is an EPIRB, which is an emergency positioning beacon. Every yacht should have one. The other thing I feel really strongly about is AIS. AIS is a positioning system which they're, they're very cheap to have, but the transponders where you can actually show your position in the ocean rather than just seeing everyone else's positions is they're more expensive. I think. Ours was five to six hundred pounds, which is about eight hundred dollars, but they've probably come down in price since then. I would suggest that everyone have an AIS transceiver so you can be seen as well as see. They are invaluable. Um, so that is that is my take on it because with our we have got we have a Garmin unit and the triangle show you get little triangles on your chart plot showing where other vessels are. All vessels over 300 tons have to carry a transceiver. Um, but it's really good to know that if you've got a cargo ship that's kind of being a bit erratic in the middle of the night, they can see you, that you're gonna bleep up. And even if all the watch on that cargo ship are asleep or playing cards down below deck, alarms will go off because the, the, the systems are programmed to alarm when they come within a certain range of you. So if you're thinking, uh, shall I, shan't I? My answer is yes. It gives us so much peace of mind. Yeah. I think that's really important, isn't yep. it? Peace of mind when we're on passage. Absolutely. So personal safety equipment is also something that we're going to touch upon in a minute, but came back to the going back to the equipment we keep on the boat, we need a full set of flares. The number of flares you need, emergency flares, is huge. I think we have about 40 or 50 flares that we split between our flare case and some in the grab bag. We also keep permanently a white phosphorus flare taped to the uh, steering bin, the steering pedestal. The white phosphorus flare is to illuminate um, it, uh, the night if you're in danger of collision. So we keep it there. So if, if by any chance, you know, we were headed, a cargo ship was heading towards us and they were not responding to any sort of signal as a last ditch uh, way of alerting them, you can just crack this flare. It's, it's super bright white. And will light up the area and if they don't see that well then you know, who knows what the, what's going to happen but so we do keep lots of flares and they again have a three or four year shelf life so you have to make sure that all your flares are in date so obviously life jackets are essential so we have the spin lock life jackets uh, they're pretty comfortable they're a bit heavy but they're as comfortable as life jackets can get I think and we had a standing rule that whenever anyone was outside they had their life jacket on and they were also clipped on and that also included if you're just sitting in the cockpit we were clipped on um, obviously not everyone kind of has that rule on board but that was something that we thought was uh, worth the inconvenience because we just knew that if everyone was tethered on at all times then it was impossible to have a man overboard situation obviously if someone goes overboard in the middle of an ocean or in actually a lot of circumstances, um, especially with big seas, then the chances of getting them back are going to be very, very slim. So to just completely negate that possibility, we had a standing rule, everyone was clipped on at all times. Sometimes this could be a bit inconvenient because, you know, if we had to jump up and get to the helm quickly, then sometimes we were stopped by our tether and we had to take the time to unclip, you know, reclip somewhere closer to the helm. Um, so it wasn't always convenient, but we, as far as we were concerned, it was a safety first situation. And also at night, and this goes for whenever Nick and I are sailing double-handed, uh, whoever is on watch is clipped on absolutely at all times, no exceptions. If something happens and they need to go forward or they need to unclip for whatever reason, then they wake up the other person on board or the person who was on watch before them. Another thing that we do and we have almost it's a it's a backup is that we have within our life jackets AIS transponders now these are little things about the size of a packet of cigarettes that actually are fit inside the uh, inside the life jacket so if you do go overboard they're either water activated or you can pull a switch and it comes up the position of the man overboard or woman overboard comes up on your chart plotter because if someone were to go overboard for whatever reason and there are scenarios that could occur the best way of getting that person or saving that person is to, for them to be picked up by another yacht, more than likely the lot, yacht they've come off. 
And the adage is that, you know, within three waves, you've lost sight of a person. So yeah. that we have, we have those as well. Yeah. So the next thing I want to talk about is power and how we generated enough power to get us across oceans. We have certain power requirements. The, the biggest one is actually the fridge, keeping the fridge at a temperature where we can keep all our frozen food and our, our vacuum packed meat safe across the Atlantic. We also have, you know, a need for running navigation software and um, the chart plotter, lights and other little bits and bobs. So it's important that we generated enough power. Now, we don't have a gen set on board. A lot of boats do, and you can use a gen set. However, here's the thing. You can only carry a certain amount of diesel, and most boats won't have enough diesel to get you across the ocean. Some do, but most don't, even with jerry cans. We have a range of about a 1,000 nautical miles, and that's pushing it. So we've got a 3,000 mile passage to do. And what you don't want to do is use all your diesel in the first half and then find out you've got no what you can't get into port or in week two you're becalmed or week three you're becalmed and you're stuck without the engine. Obviously, as we got closer to the Caribbean, we were able to be a little bit, bit more kind of free with our use of diesel. So, but don't count on a gen set because you will be trying to save diesel. So how we did it, we did it with renewables. We have solar, we have a wind generator and we have a hydro generator. Now let me just deal with those individually. Solar is fantastic, but it only works obviously while there's sun. And we have 200 watts of that solar power, but you own, all you need is a small shadow to fall over part of the solar panel and you lose about half the output. I have, I've been told that there are new panels that don't, uh, that don't suffer as much, but you still will not get the power that you think you're gonna get from solar. Number two is wind generators. Wind generators don't really work downwind because the apparent wind that you are getting is obviously, in the case of an Atlantic crossing, is seven to nine knots less than a true wind. So if you've got 20 knots of wind, you're only gonna be feeling 12, and that's not enough to get a lot of power out from wind generator. So the third thing is, is a hydro generator. Now, we love our hydro generator, and we bought a Watt and C1, hugely expensive piece of kit. Worth it in the long term? I don't know, but it does generate enough power to get the boat to, to create, well, it generates enough electricity to keep the boat running. So it generates 10 to 12 amps at seven knots, and that does everything for us. In addition to that, we were running the engine about an hour a day to, um, just to make hot water and run the water maker. So the next topic I wanna to talk to you about is probably the most important, and it's one we get asked about a lot, and it's one that I have strong opinions on, and that is self-steering versus a traditional autopilot. It also comes into the power issue as well. Absolutely. Now, I will nail my colors to the mast here and say I would never cross an ocean without self-steer. I think one of the biggest problems and the biggest reason the equipment failures you get in um, Atlantic crossings or oceanic crossings are failure of, your, of the autopilot. And here's the predicament, if you lose your autopilot, you are hand steering for weeks in, in some cases, and we know we've got friends that did this. Yep. So you need something that is gonna be reliable. Electronic autopilots are brilliant, and for, we've used ours all season. We haven't used the hydrovane, our, our, our self-steer, as much as we should have done, because autopilots are kind of easier to use, but there are downsides to them. The biggest downside in oceanic crossing is they cannot handle the stress of, being, of, of just big swell. They just can't keep up with it. And eventually, the, a lot of them just burn out. The clutches go, or the hydraulic, or the motors go. And unless you carry a spare for everything, you are going to be, you know, left in many cases without uh, a, a, an efficient way of steering across oceans. So that's the first thing. Second thing about autopilots is a lot of them can be quite noisy and sleeping where you've got a, an autopilot mounted near a bulkhead can make can be difficult. On our boat it's very difficult. Because it, 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 it whirs and hums and it, you can hear it so that's mm. the second thing. So we opted to fit self-steer. There are numerous, there was a manufacturers of self-steer. There are a lot of homemade self-steer that you see on, on kind of other yachts. We fitted a hydrovane purely because it's the only one that can be set off center. Self-steer needs to, in many cases, be in the very middle of the boat, the very midline of the boat. We couldn't have that there because we have a, a transom gate, so it had to be offset, so we bought, we bought a hydrovane. 
I love that kit. I absolutely, I, I had, by the time we crossed the Atlantic, mm. I had such a crush on it because <laughs> it just worked. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, it essentially just steers to the wind. You set a vane, um, like a wind vane, to the position of the wind, and it will keep the boat steered or steering to that wind direction. We set our hydrovane when we left Las Palmas and we didn't touch it really apart from getting weed off it and the occasional wind adjustment for three weeks. It steered us across the Atlantic Ocean. It was like it was like the fifth crew member. And essentially it meant that we could just go about the boat, just keeping the boat working, doing our jobs without worrying about steering. It also meant that we could turn off our chart plotter and obviously not use the autopilot so our energy requirements just yeah. went down completely so we didn't actually need to generate nearly as much energy as we were because we had the self-steer. So yeah and here's the thing for those of you thinking well I'm not going to buy self-steer or I can't afford self-steer or it's just too I haven't got the money in the pot that's fair enough I understand yeah. that however I would suggest seriously that you carry a spare autopilot motor a spare computer these things break and they are if they do break they can make your life a misery. So the next topic I want to talk to you about is our sail plans and the sails we use to cross oceans. We tend to prefer white sails, just our main and our jib, goose winged out with spinnaker poles. It makes it easy to control at night, we're happy leaving them up at night and if the wind gets up at night we can easily reef both the foresail and the main from the deck. And our, all our sailing is not about speed, it's about comfort, that's just how we work, comfort and safety, not in that order. <laughs> so. We also have a parasailer, a big downwind spinnaker, which we love, really good for light winds, and we have a Code Zero also, which is dedicated for light winds. The problem with the parasailer is that it's quite fiddly, and we did chaff through a halyard mid-Atlantic. For this reason, we were kind of uncomfortable flying it at night, especially seeing as we had three or four nights mid-Atlantic where the wind really picked up at 2 a.m. when we were on deck reefing our white sails. So unless the wind is guaranteed to be really light, we tend to take it down uh, at dusk. Yeah. One thing we have learnt though is to run two halyards um, on our parasailer. So we have a main halyard and we have a second halyard attached so that if we do get one that's chaffed through, the second one will take the load while we get it down because retrieving, um, lowering a parasailer onto a deck while it's still attached to a, a redundant halyard is far easier than pulling it in from the sea and then having to putting it back together and pushing it back into its snuffer. We're talking from experience. We definitely are. <laughs> so that's that. Sailing across an ocean isn't just about power requirements and sail plans and safety. It's also about comfort and it's about, it is about morale. Um, something that, as I said before, we're not going to touch on too much uh, because it's such a big subject. But I think that little luxuries on board are important. Um, obviously that can take lots of different forms. Uh, for us it was mainly food based. Um, so, I mean, we had a lot of, you know, chocolate cookies tucked away or whatever. Um, things for the halfway mark and things for, you know, a thousand miles to go or just like little surprises that we, um, we brought out at major milestones. And beer. We had a beer every evening. One we were allowed each. one beer each per evening, as a, and we all had dinner together in the cockpit every evening. Um, so yeah, little things like that can really keep morale high. Um, but in terms of actual equipment, uh, which is kind of what this video is meant to be about, uh, we had uh, a couple of things which I thought were kind of frivolous when I bought them, but I actually think were really fantastic in the end. Um, the big one was a bread machine. You can get bread that lasts for weeks and weeks and weeks, but I personally do not want to put something full of that many preservatives into my body unless I am literally kind of <laughs> dying. So um, we chose not to go down that route. We preferred to eat as healthily as possible, uh, which meant making our own bread on passage. And I mean, you know, obviously you can do it all by hand and lots of people do and I think that that is a much more kind of romantic way of doing things but for me it was easier to just put things into a bread machine, press the start button and two hours later I've got bread. Um, so that was one thing that was great, we had fresh bread 
not every day, but maybe every second or third day. Um, and that, that was a real morale booster. Actually. Yeah, it the was. The smell of fresh bread is probably was a bigger morale booster than fresh coffee, or fresh fish, or beer. Yeah. The smell of it, it, everyone it cheers everyone up. Smelling a loaf break baking mid Atlantic. Yeah. So that was that was good. And you can also make cakes. And I made one cake, which turned out to be a bit of a disaster. But you know, more accomplished bakers than me can make banana br bread for all your kind of overripe bananas and that kind of thing. So one final topic that I'm only going to just touch on briefly is our communications at sea and what we use to communicate um, with land and with other boats. We could do something kind of far more in depth because it is a complicated subject and there are a lot of discussions about what is it worth it? Are certain things worth the investment? Is an SSB worth the investment? Is a satellite phone worth the investment? It depends on what your sailing is going to do and how where your sailing is going to take you. We have quite a few different ways of communicating with the outside world. We have an SSB radio, we have a sat phone which is connected to a modem and we also have um, like a GPS, it's called a yellow brick, which is a GPS tracker, allows you to send and receive certain messages. And those three things take us across the oceans. They all have various merits, uh, various downsides, various upsides, and we'll touch on that in a separate video. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, I really hope that you enjoyed this and found it really informative. Be sure to comment down below so that we can keep the discussion going. Over the next few weeks we're going to be bringing out even more informative episodes like this, so if you don't want to miss out then just subscribe right here and join us over on Facebook here. Thanks again for watching. Oh. <laughs> 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 There's a cat. <laughs> Alright. Um, Start again. Woo!